All right. Hopefully some more folks will be coming on in here in a minute. We're starting in Luke chapter six tonight. Glad to see all of you here. Thank you for being here for this class. You encourage me. And I, I just hope uh, that maybe I have encouraged you in like manner. In like yes. manner. That's again what it's all about. Um, before we begin, let's pray. We're grateful, Father, for this day, and I'm grateful for the fact that we have a chance to open your book to try to learn the lessons that you want us to learn, to see what your son did and how he lived. Father, please help us to be the light to the world. I pray that constantly, Father, because now more than ever, it seems like the world needs light. Help us to be what you want us to be. Help us to encourage one another and lift one another up. Help us to encourage one another to be more like Jesus. To look and see how he lived, what he said, and how he dealt with all the things that he had to deal with. Father, help us to be like him. I pray for each and every one of the students that's here as well as online. I fervently pray for them, Father. And I ask you to please be with them whatever problems and trials they have, whatever difficulties they're struggling with right now. I pray that you please be with them. Father, help us to always keep the faith. Help us to always live every moment expecting your return. Help us, Lord, to be ready. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 <clears throat> we finished up uh, chapter five last week talking about fasting. We picked right on up now. John is now talking about the idea of the Sabbath and what's going on with the Sabbath. We're going to take a few moments and kind of go back to the Old Testament a little bit and remind ourselves a little bit about this. Verse 1, it happened on the second Sabbath after the first. And again, obviously, this was going back up to what he had talked about earlier in a, in a previous Sabbath that had, that had gone on there. We remember the idea that the Jews had a lot of opinions about the Sabbath day. We're going to talk about what's going on there. He went through the grain fields, and his disciples plucked the heads of grain and ate them, rubbing them in their hands. Now, if you're reading from the King James Version, this probably says he went through the cornfield. They didn't have corn, okay? That was just something that, that the translators trying to get across to bring out that idea. But if you're reading from the New King James Version, it says they're just going through these grain fields. And, then, and in all probability, the grain fields that they were going through at this time may have been uh, barley fields, wheat fields. Under the Old Testament law, in the book of Deuteronomy, we find the idea <clears throat> and the command in Deuteronomy 23, 25, that they were to not pick all the edges of their fields, not pick all their grapes. We remember reading this in the Leviticus numbers in Deuteronomy. So here you have a situation coming through where Jesus and his disciples were hungry. And so in all of this situation, they were going through there and notice they plucked the heads of grain and ate them, rubbing them in their hands. As I said, by this time, the Jews were very adamant about the Sabbath. And the reason for this was because of some things that happened in the Old Testament. Forbidden on, <clears throat> forbidden on the Sabbath day would be reaping, threshing, in other words, cutting the grain from the stalks, uh, winnowing, and preparing the food. And as far as they were concerned, as the Jews were concerned, the disciples in Jesus broke every one of these commands. All of these laws around the law of actually breaking the Sabbath. Now let's talk very quickly about what's going on here. Go back to 2 Chronicles chapter 36. <clears throat> 2 Chronicles chapter 36. I want to remind you, and if you don't and if you're not aware of this, but I just want to just kind of remind you of this. The last book in the Hebrew Bible is 2 Chronicles. It's not Malachi. Malachi would have been added, in, or not added, but actually a part of another section of the Bible. They broke the Hebrew Bible down in three sections, the law, the prophets, and <clears throat> wisdom literature, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and so forth. Second Chronicles would be the actual book that ended up the Hebrew Bible. And as we come down to Second Chronicles chapter 36, look at verse 15. The Lord God of their fathers sent warning to them by these messengers, rising up early and sending them, because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. But they mocked the messengers of God, 
and despised his words, scoffed at his prophets, until the wrath of the Lord arose against his people, till there was no remedy. In other words, he had pleaded with them, he had talked with them, he had done everything he could, punished them to try to bring them back, and they said, no, that wasn't going to happen. So therefore he brought against them the king of the Chaldeans who killed their young men with a sword in the house of their sanctuary, had no compassion on young man or virgin or on the agent of the weak. He gave them all into his hand and all the articles of the house of God, great and small, the treasures of the house of the Lord, the treasures of the king and the leaders, all these he took to Babylon. Then they burned the house of God, broke down the walls of Jerusalem, burned all of its palaces with fire, and destroyed all its precious possessions. And those who escaped from the sword he carried away to Babylon, where they became servants to him and his sons until the rule of the kingdom of Persia. Now look in verse 21. Why did God do this? To fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah until the land had enjoyed her Sabbaths, as long as she lay desolate, she kept Sabbath to fulfill 70 years. Okay, we're going to go on back and go back to listen. Look at this a little bit more. All righty. To fulfill the Sabbaths is what he was talking about. So as you're looking at this, Jeremiah had prophesied about it as well as this whole situation here. Now let's go back to Exodus chapter 23. Exodus chapter 23. <clears throat> In Exodus chapter 23, and of course we remember that one of the Ten Commandments was what? Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. In Exodus chapter 23, verses 10 through 13. Six years you shall sow your land and gather in its produce, but the seventh year you shall let it rest and lie fallow, that the poor of your people may eat, and what they leave the beast of the field may eat, in like manner you shall do with your vineyard and your olive groves. Six days you shall do your work. On the seventh day you shall rest, that your ox and your donkey may rest, and the son of your female servant and the stranger may be refreshed. So what's he telling them? Six years they were to work their, work their fields. But on the seventh year, they were to allow their fields to lie fallow. In other words, they weren't supposed to work it. For the poor, and, huh? for the poor to eat. For the poor to eat, yes, that was part of it. Also, it was a test of their faith. They didn't plant anything that seventh year. So what did they have to rely on? They had to rely on everything that they were gathered up through this first six years. And then what? And then God promised, he said, if you do this, I will give you enough seed to where you will be able to plant on the year after the Sabbath year. And you'll be able to have your crops again. But every seven years, they were supposed to do that. And I believe as we look at this in the book of Exodus, as well as Leviticus as well, Part of the reason for that was is God knew that um, the land needed to rest. We plant and put on chemical fertilizer on a lot of our food to help push the, you know, keep the soil, the nutrients going. They didn't have that. The extent of what they had at that stage was what? Manure. And that was about it. You know, that was it. So they had to let the land rest so that the land could kind of revive, could kind of take everything that it had and build the nutrients that would go into the plants. Yes, it would be arid as well. So that's part of it as well. So you have this in Exodus chapter 23, 13. Now go to Exodus chapter 31. Exodus chapter 31. And again, you see this same idea brought out. God is saying this over and over and over and over again. In Exodus 31, 12, the Lord said to Moses, speak to the children of Israel, surely my Sabbath you shall keep. It is a sign between me and you throughout your generations that you may know that I am the Lord who sanctifies you. You shall keep the Sabbath, therefore, for it is holy for you. Everyone who profanes it shall surely be put to death. For whoever does any work on it, that person shall be cut off from among his people. Work shall be done for six days, but the Sabbath is a Sabbath of rest, holy to the Lord. Whoever does any work on the Sabbath day, he shall surely be put to death. That's how serious God looked at this situation. So the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations as a perpetual covenant. It's a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. In six days, the Lord made the heavens and the earth. And on the seventh day, he rested and was refreshed. And that's quoting from where? 
Genesis chapter one, when he created the heavens and the earth. So he made an end of speaking with him on Mount Sinai. So here you have in Exodus chapter 23, again in Exodus chapter 31. Now go, if you will, to Leviticus chapter 26. Leviticus chapter 26. <clears throat> All righty. 34. <clears throat> he talks about the fact in Exodus 26, and you find the same ideal in Deuteronomy chapter 28, where he's giving the list of the cursing and the blessings. And this was part of the covenant idea back in those times. They would, the, the and I think I've shared with this idea, I know in the Exodus Leviticus numbers from Deuteronomy class I did, but I just want to get across to you that God is king of kings. And what he would demand is that the kings of Israel and the kings of Judah live up to his commands. And so part of the end of the covenant treaty would be, here's what will happen if you obey God. And he talks about the blessings. Here's what will happen if you choose not to obey God. When you compare this in Leviticus chapter 26, in verses 1 through 13, he tells them how he's going to bless them if they do what he has commanded them to do. But in verse 14, and going through the end of the chapter, verse 45, he said, this is what's going to happen if you don't. So what does he say? Beginning in verse, as I said earlier, 34. He said, I will scatter you among the nations, draw out the sword after you. Your land shall be desolate, your cities waste. Then the land shall enjoy its Sabbaths as long as it lies desolate and you are in your enemy's land, that the land shall rest and enjoy its Sabbath. As long as it lies desolate, it shall rest for the time you it did not rest on the sure Sabbath when you dwelt in it. Those of you that are left, I will send faintness into their hearts. And so he goes on here and talks more about what's going to happen because of their failure. And notice how he really keys in on the idea of verse 32 through 34, their failure to keep up the Sabbaths was going to be what this punishment was going to be bringing it about. Well, just keep that in mind. And, and so you, you see this whole idea here. He sold, sold them this time after time after time after time. Second Chronicles, the end of the Old Testament ends with what? They didn't do it. Now, I, I kind of give you that background because if there was one lesson the children of Israel learned after all of that, after this, they were making, they were sticklers for keeping the Sabbath day. Yeah. yeah. Is there a story about, I, I remember that setting, some point in the a story about a guy that fell and gathering sticks or something? Yeah, on the Sabbath day. Yes, there is. Uh, I can't remember exactly where that particular passage is, but it is in Exodus. It is, he was gathering sticks on the Sabbath day, and that was one of those situations, what we call this case law, and they called him aside and they brought him to Moses and said, what shall we do? They said, let me talk to God. And he, he makes an example of him and stoned him to death because of that. God was serious about this. And they had failed to do it. That's what the, as I said, the end of the Old Testament brings out. So between that time and that 50 years or the, you know, the 40, uh, the 70 years that they were in captivity, they said, you know what? We're not going to do that again. So you had the Pharisees and the Sadducees and all these others start to make laws about what you could and couldn't do. Yes. Right. That's right. And again, the idea of that particular passage emphasizes the idea that you can keep the law, but if you don't have the heart, it's still not acceptable to God. And again, this is what Jesus came to really emphasize. As we get down to a lot of the things he's talking about here, it really kind of boils back down to what? Their heart in wanting to do it. Because they learned such a lesson about the Sabbath day, they made a whole bunch of laws about what you could and couldn't do on the Sabbath day. And so what the Pharisees and the Sadducees were condemning Jesus over 
was their misunderstanding of what work is. As I said, they made rules. If you were going to have to take a journey on the Sabbath day, you couldn't travel no more than seven eighths of a mile. Now you won't find that anywhere in the Bible, but who made that up? Well, some rabbis and all got together and said, well, how far can a person walk on the Sabbath day and still not break the Sabbath? Well, that's in, in the Mishnah. Huh? That, that's it may very well be in the Mishnah and some of these Talmuds, the Babylonian Talmuds, that a lot of the rabbis were writing and commenting on exactly what would be involved in that. Mm -hmm. And the Pharisees were sticklers for this. I mean, very big sticklers for this. Were they, were they allowed to walk? Though? Yeah, they were allowed to walk. I've seen some Jewish guys say they can walk. Oh, maybe that's the reason. I saw a, a rabbi that said that he could only walk. Carry yeah. So, it, but it kind of gets ridiculous because they're trying to find a way around it anyway. He's like putting stuff in his coat so he's not. Literally yeah, yeah. And, and you see, it, it's it was not just this, but again, some of the Babylonian Talmud and some of the Mishnahs and things along that line also talked about if you were you were walking down the down a street, okay, and you had a buddy beside you. And it just so happened at that moment in time, at that precise moment in time, as you're walking down the street, your buddy is on your left side. And so you're walking in and you walk by a building. And at that moment in time, the building collapses on your buddy. I'm sorry. Now, what do you do? <laughs> According to the rabbis, you can only move enough of the bricks to see if he was still alive or not. If he was dead, you had to leave him there. Until the next day, until the Sabbath was over, before you could do anything for it. If he was alive, you could do enough to stabilize him, but you couldn't pour oil on his wounds or anything like that that would help him because that would be healing him. That would be helping him heal. And we're sitting there shaking our heads about this and thinking, man, that's the silliest thing I've ever heard in my life. But they actually made up these rules. Right. Yeah. And in fact, we're going to talk about that in the next, next few verses, verses six through 11, where again, he does heal on the Sabbath day. So you see what Jesus is having a controversy with more often than not is not what the law said and what the law taught is what everybody said that the law said and what they said it taught. And by the way, that idea is still with us today. When we go to certain commentaries or certain people because we trust them, as opposed to looking at what God did and what Jesus did and what, what it actually says, that's where we start getting into trouble. So what were they doing? They were doing something that was legitimate according to the law of Moses. They were walking through a field they were not taking a scythe and cutting it down and then, and then just doing, no, they were walking through the field. They might grab some of it in their hands, do like this to it, to where they had some grain and just pop it in their mouth because they were hungry. That's what all, that's all it would have consist of. But the Pharisees, no, you're working on the Sabbath day. And so the Bible says, some of them said, some of the Pharisees said to them, why are you doing what's not lawful to do on the Sabbath day? There's nowhere that it could forbid that. Well, yes. So you're saying that's not, that's it, not work. He, when he makes a reference to David, mm -hmm. that, was that on the Sabbath? No. And this is, um, this is a whole other situation. Okay. Because it's like he answered them. With David. And we're going to talk about what's <laughs> happening here in David. All right. The bottom line is they were staking their hope the religious leaders were staking their hope that on Sabbath keeping after they had been condemned before and how God had talked to them about that, that we better make sure we get this part right. Now they wouldn't even do everything else the law said, but they want to make sure they got that right. So they said, what are you doing with slot and awful on the Sabbath day? And then Jesus answered them and said, have you not read this? What David did when he was hungry, when he and those were with him, he went into the house of God, took and ate the showbread and gave some to those who, with him, which is not lawful for any but the priest to eat. Now, the context of this passage goes back to 1 Samuel chapter 21. David was fleeing from Saul. Saul was the king. 
and he comes to the priests and he's hungry. He and his men with him are hungry. And they said, is there any food to eat? And, and the priest said, the only thing here to eat is the showbread. Under the law, the only priest that would be allowed to eat the showbread were the priest's family. David was not of the priest's family. He was of a tri different tribe. Huh? The showbread would be something like, and again, when you go back to Leviticus and you study this in a lot more detail, it's something like the uh, unleavened bread, an unleavened oat loaf that had, it could not have any loaf or any leaven in it whatsoever. This inside the tabernacle, they would have what they call the table of showbread. There would be 12, um, 12 pieces of this bread uh, representing the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. The only people that would be allowed to eat that would be the priests that were serving in the tabernacle or the temple. David would not have been allowed to eat it. And yet, in this particular circumstance, you know, the idea that he's trying to get across is this. David did eat that. They broke the law. David broke the law. He said he did not sir. Huh? He said, Jesus said he did not sir. No, he didn't. He said he did not say anything about sin. He said, which is not lawful for any but the priest to eat. He obviously did not sin by doing that because he was hungry. There was the law that was that was trumping that other law there in that respect. So here, here's the thing that, that I want to get across to you. And this is what he's trying to say. If now, by the way, the passage that I was telling you about that only the priest could eat it is Leviticus chapter 25 verses five through nine. I knew I had a note here somewhere, but I just wanted to remind you to always go back to the Bible and, and make sure you got that right. So it's Leviticus 25, 5 through 9. Um, so, yes. Just saying one law can trump another. <laughs> In this situation, David was fleeing for his life. And thinking about it in this respect, he was hungry. And fleeing for his life in this particular circumstance, this was. Let's be honest about this. This was extenuating circumstances beyond just, you know, it's not like he went and waltzed up there one day and say, oh, by the way, I want to eat some of that bread. That's not, that was not what was going on. If he hadn't had some nourishment, he couldn't have run any further. That's what it boiled down to. Him and his co compatriots. Huh? He's not of the tribe of Levi. He could not have legitimately eat that. But if he had not eaten then, what would have happened? He, he may have, I mean, got so weak that if Saul had caught up to him, he would have died. So I think, again, it would depend upon answering your question, Carrie. And again, it's, it's hard for us to really figure this out. But Jesus used this particular example because, specifically because the Jews honored David. He was the greatest king that they had. So if David had not done this, would he have continued to live? Would he have been the king? And so that was the point that he's trying to, uh, trying to, trying to do. The Pharisees were scrutinizing Jesus now. It seems like every time, you, as you continue to read through this, they're always going to be the Pharisees watching it, looking, looking. Or something to accuse him of. And Jesus just simply makes the statement here. You condemn me. Would you have condemned David for what he did? That's exactly what's happening. And, and you see, that's the whole circumstance behind that. Yes. We have another message where um, it's the same thing. They're getting on with Jesus for doing healing on the Sabbath. Right. And he says, uh, if you had, if your ox fell in the ditch on the Sabbath, wouldn't you get it out of there? Right. I mean, you, would, you wouldn't leave it in the ditch. Right. Uh, and so if that would be work, you, you would violate the, yeah. to, to do that for. That's right. So that's that's right. But he's saying that you need to do good. Mm -hmm. So again, it's just the saying, like one law trumps another law. Depending on the circumstance, I guess you because might say that. Yeah. Because of the circumstance. Yeah. I've always, I've always had trouble. <clears throat> I, I thought he was trying to say, no, you misunderstand what the law is. You can you can do good on the Sabbath. There's no law against doing good on the Sabbath. So you're not you're not violating the Sabbath law mm -hmm. because there's no law against doing good. Right. 
but yet he did violate the Sabbath. That's so it's, and, and, it's like a, 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 it's kind of confusing. I won't argue that fact. I won't yeah. argue that fact. But I think it go again. It goes back to the idea of what is the motive. Are you trying to do it like they were doing it under the Old Testament, where they weren't even giving any regard to the Sabbath law, to anything, doing their business? Remember the book of Nehemiah. He talked about the fact that Nehemiah, that the Jews, whenever they brought back and he started building the walls, there were people coming in and selling goods on the Sabbath. And Nehemiah said, "You come back here and you do that again, you'll be in jail." That's it. So this was lessons that they had to learn. I think another aspect of it was the fact that they were making laws around it to keep you from breaking the laws. And that comes in, especially in Matthew 23, where he condemns the scribes and the Pharisees because he says, you're adding burdens that nobody can bear. Do you get into the point to where you're making all these laws to keep you from breaking the laws? That what? Nobody could, nobody could get to heaven that way. And Jesus condemns that. Brother? You know that one, uh, I think it's that priest worship that <clears throat> I don't actually see. But um, you know that for many years I missed all of that, particularly when I was answering people that were talking about the Bible. And I used to go over the Old and the Old and all. But you know the, the more important part of that verse actually is I desire mercy, not sacrifice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He was really just completely if you're not going to say, well, go to me after that. You know, right. Just to show me. I think that's part of it. In this situation, I think what he was saying is the Pharisees dared not condemn David for what he did, and what he did was wrong. It was against the Old Testament law. The same respect. They're making all these rules about what you can and can't do. It wasn't like in this situation, in this situation, it was not like that they had gone out there with a scythe and was cutting down big chunks of this wheat and then walking all over it and then taking a pitchfork and throwing it up in the air to where the chaff would blow away. What were they doing? They were just walking through the fields, grabbing some with their hands, doing this, popping it in their mouth. That was the extent of it. It wasn't like they were making a full meal out of it, just enough to keep them going as they're going from one place to the next. And they, the Pharisees, condemned Jesus and his disciples for doing that. Heavy burdens that nobody could bear. Were they watching people? Yeah, that's exactly what they're doing. That's exactly. You're, you've got the exact point because they're trying to find, he didn't go through their schools, et cetera, et cetera, and therefore what? They didn't trust him. They didn't trust him. And later before it's all over with, what does it really come down to? It comes down to trying to catch him to where they can get rid of him, right? Let's go on six through 11. It happened on another Sabbath. Also, that he entered the synagogue and taught. And a man was there whose right hand was withered. I've always loved this story. I've, I've enjoyed this story so very, very much. All righty, so he's teaching in the synagogue. Now, by the way, I want you to think about this. Anybody who taught in the synagogue was working. All right? <laughs> think about that one for just a moment. But that's legitimate because why? Because they were going through the Old Testament law. That's what, that's what part of it was. What is what? Yeah, I think kind of what it boils down to. There was a man there whose right hand was withered. Now, again, we don't know exactly what sure it is. <clears throat> Only Luke tells us it was the right hand. When you look in Matthew chapter 12, you see that the, he just simply says that the hand, Matthew chapter 12, where Matthew gives us this account, Verse 10, he said, there was a man who had a withered hand. <clears throat> and they asked him, saying, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? That they might accuse him. What was the whole reason then for them asking the question? They didn't care about the man who had a withered hand. They were going to see if he was going to break the law that 
you can't heal, you can't do anything to heal a person on the Sabbath day because that's work. Again, where do they get that idea? Somebody somewhere wrote that, you know, well, you can make sure, you can, you can keep them alive on the Sabbath, but you can't do no more than that. Okay? And again, think about how silly that is. Of course, back in those days, I'm sure they didn't understand CPR and all that other stuff. But I want you to think about the idea, suppose a man had a heart attack on the Sabbath, and they're sitting there, and if you've never done... <laughs> Think about this for a moment. If you've never done CPR, that's hard work. That's hard work. So just think about it and chew on that for a few moments. So what happens here? Again, going back to Luke, he entered the synagogue and taught. There was man, those whose right hand was withered. So the scribes and the Pharisees watched him closely, whether he would heal on the Sabbath that they might find an accusation against him. But he knew their thoughts. And again, this says so much about Jesus. And he said to the man who had the withered hand, arise and stand here. <clears throat> he said, arise and stand here. Now, I want you to notice, all Jesus told him to do was what? Stand up and what? And, and that's it. That's, that's all he did. Now, standing up is not a work, is it? You're just standing up. It's not like Jesus and handling some of these other situations where he would, uh, you know, speak over them or, or something like that. He just actually just says, stand here. And so he stood, stood and arose and stood, and Jesus said to them, I will ask you one thing. Is it lawful to do good or to do evil, to save life, or destroy it. Jesus was seeking to save. They were seeking to destroy. Think about it. All righty. And so, and notice this, when he looked out around them all, Mark gives us an interesting further thing in Mark chapter three. Mark chapter three. Look at this account. Same account, Mark gives us a shorter thing, but notice, uh, this is extremely interesting. Mark 3, verse 5. When he looked around at them with anger, being grieved at the hardness of their hearts, he said to the man, stretch out your hand. Mark is the one that tells us that Jesus was angry. And the Bible also says that it grieved him in his heart that these folks were so concerned about stipulations of their law that they were not thinking about the person that needed to be healed. I think again, Jesus had him call out rise and stand here in front of everybody so that everybody would see that Jesus didn't do anything. All he did was what? Speak. And they surely are not going to condemn him for speaking because he had been teaching all up to this point in time, right? So he asked this question and he says, stretch out your hand. You do not see where Jesus touched him. You do not see where Jesus did anything. He just commanded him, stretch out your hand, and it was healed. <laughs> and what, what could they do about it? I think, I, I think there was just the, I, the, the power that Jesus had was showing itself so vividly here at this point in time that he could heal just by speaking a word, and it infuriated them. It infuriated them. Think about this. In, again, in Luke's account, they were filled with rage and discussed with one another what they might do to Jesus. Filled with rage. I mean, they want him no matter what. What would they do? What would happen if they had what? If 
they had rather than persecuted him, they were like very I we could speculate on that all day long. I wouldn't even begin to know in that respect, but that's just a good good question to ask. I'm just, I'm just wondering. Yeah, yeah. We're in Luke chapter six. Okay, good to see you here tonight. In the rain and all that other stuff. Thank you, thank you for being here. So they were filled with rage. We're in Luke chapter six, verse eleven, and discussed with one another what they might do to Jesus. They hated Jesus because he did good on the Sabbath. They loved their rules and their regulations more than God and their fellow man. Okay. <clears throat> and again, think about this. Sometimes we've got to be even careful in the church, don't we? Huh? I am recording. Okay. Somebody can't get in. Rosalind can't get in and... Um, I've, I've, I've clicked the button where she can get in, but for some reason or another, she wasn't able to. So she said she'd watch the recording later. So, so that's what that's about. All righty. So um, where was I? Yeah, even in the church, we've got to be careful because sometimes we make little rules and regulations that we that, that doesn't say nothing about. No, number one, I want you to think about this in this respect. <clears throat> We don't read anywhere in the New Testament where they bought land, built the church building, and, and had the church. Most of the time, they met in people's homes. Philemon tells us that. Um, so this was not, and again, they, they probably were very poor, and they would not have went and built, bought, bought land and built, built a church building. You know what I'm trying to say? Mm -hmm. It was just something that they could not have afforded to do. So we build these big church buildings. We buy this land, we build these church, big church buildings, and then we start making rules and regulations about what you can and can't do in the church building. Well, some, some things. Some things. Yeah. You know, it, it, the thing that I'm, we spend more time talking about what you can and can't do in a church building. The elders seem to spend more time making decisions about repairing a church building. Um, you know what I'm trying to say? All that money we're spending. And, and I, I never will forget this. We, we built the South Cobb Church of Christ and, and we're sitting on about five acres of land and we built that building and it cost about, a you know, this was years ago, about a million dollars. I'm like, wow, just... I never would have dreamed we would have spent a million dollars on the building. Okay. I mean, but, but we did. And then I became an elder about 10 years later or something along that line. And the first big decision we had to make was replacing the heat and air conditioning units because they were wore out the heater and air conditioner. And it's kind of like, how much is this going to cost? How much? For the big church? It's a, it's a pretty good sized church. It is. It could seat 300. But whenever you start, and again, the way it was built, I'm just sharing with you, the way it was built, they didn't give a lot of thought to. They should have built the thing in such a way to where the air con heat and air conditioning system would have been in the, set outside in the middle instead of the very back. Because some of those units are having to push air 120 feet or 120, you know, way up in the front part of the building, and they wear out quicker. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I like to pass that when I found out how much it was going to cost to replace everything. Oh. <clears throat> and here we are now replacing some the second time. The cost of saving souls. Huh? And, and, and it's just absolutely insane. How, to me, how much money... And I got to thinking about what if we had used that money for missionaries or what if we had used that money for spreading the gospel some other way? And it may be, it may be, and I don't want to prolong this too much, but it may be that the Lord has allowed this pandemic to affect us, to help us to realize we can still do church without a big building. Okay. And, and it's, it's not about a building. It's about the people. 
I don't get off that soapbox, all right? But, but it's something to think about. And, and to me, as I was reading this, is exactly what I was thinking about in that long, which can and can't do in a church building. And, and I understand what your points are. Um, you know, flowers in the church building. I've heard a church is split over that. Yeah. You know, one thing, you know, I was going to say, two <clears throat> things is not biblical. Huh? That's, that people all across the churches everywhere have come to this. There's nothing in the Bible that teaches that a man should have a suit or have luxurious clothes. Uh, yeah, I agree. <laughs> but we also. It's actually the opposite. Yeah. It's actually the opposite. And a lot of times as you read through scripture. Like, that's yeah. right. That's right. And so you see, that's, that says a lot, but we also, we make the arguments about, you know, well, you know, you need to dress your best. Material. Yeah. Material. Yes. Speaking of the Sabbath day, Sabbath day, they do the important the Sabbath day, breaking up, and number 15, 32 about the man was picking a stick from the Sabbath day. He was think, stone. Yeah. So they do that important rules, but you said today. Mm -hmm. and, and I think they've tried to, in a lot of situations, we've tried to add that to the Sunday mm -hmm. services. But Sunday is not the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. It's not. That thing, thing. So we're mm -hmm. not. say that Sunday's the Sabbath. Okay. Yeah. And so that's it. That was <laughs> yeah. I think we did. Yeah. We did it in the early yeah. office, right? Right. The thing I'm trying to get at in, in, in all of this, is for us to stop and think for a few minutes. I'm not condemning us for what we do or don't do. I don't misunderstand what I'm trying to say there. But, you know, we're following customs. And then those customs become laws. And those laws then become what? They become things that divide the people. And listen, there's nothing Satan loves better than divide his people. And that's just the bottom line at it. Why do you think we have so many denominations today, all of them teaching so many different things, some of the things just totally opposite of one another. Why? Is that what God wants? No. I know some brethren that thinks it's a sin to eat in a church building. Okay, yeah, to eat in a church building. Like sitting down at a fellowship meal. They like believe it's a sin. Huh? Yeah, like we did here before class. So you, you see the point I'm trying to make. And again, I appreciate what, what uh, Beverly's saying here, dealing with the customs, some said don't want to eat in the church building, you name it. If there's a way that we could divide over it, we'll find a way. <laughs> right? And that's just, that's just crazy. That's, that's just crazy. And I think some folks do. And I think some folks go back and, and again, you know, talking about paving a parking lot, putting a water fountain in a church building. Where do you read that in the Bible? Where do you read about a church building in the Bible? Well, All right, let's go down that road. Yeah, it's just it's just something that some folks don't want, and they're going to make an issue of it. What do you mean? They just don't feel like that it needs to happen. They don't think that you oh. need to have that. So, you see. All right. <laughs> like I said, we can spend hours on this, <laughs> but we got to go on. Well, cha right. Chapter 6 and verse 12. Here's where he then decides to choose his disciples. It came to pass in those days that he went out to the mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer to God. Uh, I'll circle that, maybe underline that in your Bible. He continued all night in prayer before God. I want to challenge you to think about that whenever Jesus was facing big decisions, he prayed and prayed and prayed. He knew what the Father's will was. He was part of the of the Godhead, he knew what that will was, but he wanted to spend time with the Father. And notice when it was day, he called his disciples to himself. All right, what are the disciples? The disciples comes from a Greek word, which means they're the learners. These are the ones that's been following him. And, and he's now had a lot to choose from. We know that other passages talk about that there was 120. Okay, that seemed to have followed him around. But out of this 120, he chooses 12. All righty. Now let's spend some time talking about these. From these, these disciples, from these disciples, he chose 12 among whom he also named apostles. And I always, now what does the word apostle mean? One cent, one cent. 
One sent with a mission. It's kind of like you've got the actual word means they're, you're sending out with a mission. And later they become the apostles that we read about. Yes, sir. We have apostles today. I like, don't like, like if I'm an evangelist, I could be one sent. I could be regarded as an apostle, not not the formal apostle of the twelve, mm -hmm. but as a as a as a someone sent to spread. The yeah, I, yeah, I see what you're trying to say there. And and if we understood that, but again, I think we've got to be very careful about that it's because yeah, it's it's just a title. Yeah, just because just some people activity. could could say that they, they're more important than some other members of the church when they've not been chosen like Jesus chose all, these. All of them are yeah. sent. Everybody's sent. All of us are sent to the world. Yes. So, okay, good point. All righty. He named these apostles. Now, have you ever have you ever studied these guys? I don't know. Okay, let's just spend a little bit of time studying them for just a very, very short period of time. Let's look at their names. Simon, whom he also named Peter. And a lot of times he's called Simon Peter, all right? Andrew, his brother. Now, what did Simon and Andrew do before they started following Jesus? They were fishermen. We've already saw that earlier in Luke chapter 5. And you, every one of these was the Jews. Huh? Every one of these disciples had been a Jew. Yeah, every one of these are Jews. Huh? At this stage of the game, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. James and John were fishermen. James and John also were fishermen. And we know this from John's account in John chapter one. So it seemed like Simon and Andrew and Peter and John were in business together. And obviously it was a somewhat lucrative business. No, I believe the James of, that wrote the book of James is the half brother of Jesus. Matthew chapter 13, verse 55, okay? Then you had Philip and Bartholomew. Now, we don't know nothing about Philip and Bartholomew, except in John chapter 1, Nathaniel and Philip is mentioned. So Nathaniel may be Bartholomew, may be another name. Okay? Just want you to think about that for a moment. Because you don't find Bartholomew in this list, but in John 1, you do find Bartholomew. So it may very well be that Nathaniel is the same person as Bartholomew. Okay. Uh, no, no. There's three places in the scriptures that list, list these names. Here, in Matthew, and again in Acts chapter 1. Okay. So, <clears throat> um, Mark um, 135. Mark 135. I'm sorry, I said Matthew, but it's Mark 135. Um, Luke 5, no, I'm sorry, Luke 6, 12 through 16, and Acts chapter 1. And when you start comparing all those lists, you start seeing some names that pop up a little bit differently, okay? All righty. Then you have Philip and Bartholomew, Matthew. Matthew was what? Tax collector. And Thomas. We always remember doubting Thomas, right? And where did he get that? Where do we get that? He had to, that's right. After the resurrection, I have to touch his hands. Okay, that's where you get the word doubting Thomas. James, the son of Alphaeus. And so here you have two different James and another one called Simon the Zealot. Now, Simon the Zealot, Simon the Zealot probably was, I want you to think about this for a moment. The word zealot suggests somebody that was a, at that particular time, it suggested somebody that was zealous for Judaism. Yeah. And they were out. A lot of these zealots would turn around and start the war with the Romans because they would attack Roman soldiers and things along this line. That's not him. No, but he obviously felt that way. Now you think, just a minute. Matthew was a tax collector and Simon hated anything to do with the Romans. <laughs> Here you have two people working together 
And, and yeah, and can you imagine what they both had to learn at the feet of Jesus? Yeah, that means that you mean I got to accept that tax collector? Matthew could have said, Lord, you're making a mistake because he's going to get us in a bunch of trouble. Yeah. So the, the thing I'm pointing out to you, and I hope you see this point, is the fact that <laughs> it's only in Christ that we can solve the problem of living together. It's only in Christ, you know, even the most opposite people may unite in their love for him if we really love him and learn to love one another. And if God, Jesus, is able to take these guys and make them into a brotherhood to where the point that they're the ones that's preaching on the day of Pentecost together, he can do the same thing with us today. <clears throat> and the last name that's always mentioned Judas Iscariot. Every time his name is mentioned in the list, every time is always brought out he's the traitor. That's exactly right. But you've also got to remember that this was being written after the events took place. So, and again, every place Judas Iscariot's name is mentioned, he's called the traitor. So, another great lesson this teaches us is you can sit under the very best of teachers, Jesus himself. I don't know. I don't know what he listened to. I think maybe he, Jesus, maybe he was something like a zealot too, and Jesus isn't exactly what he thought he was going to be. So then he just says, okay, then I have no problem with doing what I'm going to do. Yeah, I know, I know. Mm -hmm. that's right this was something planned from the for the foundation of the world so all of these things come into play um do what we don't know john gives us a little bit more of a hint in john's account it says that john that judas loved money he was a lover of money. And he obviously, it also emphasizes the idea, and some people do think this, that he may very well, well may very well have been the treasurer of the group. He's the one watching over all the money because the Bible says he held the bag. He held the bag. And again, some people from that, let me see if I but can. He threw the money right? Yeah, the 30 pieces of silver afterwards when he realized what he had done. But um, I think it was like, God is not choosing a dream team like a draft. He's not choosing based on his talent. It's like, you're going to take the, you're going to be the worst and then make them great. But like Paul says, I have to come to Jesus. Mm -hmm. But they say it out of Think about where Paul would have been. I mean, Paul was not on a good route. No. If he had not saved Paul, he would not have been like broken. He was not, he was killing Christians. Well, no, he was actually he was probably not doing it himself. He was definitely out of hand. He probably coerced people. That's yeah. him. He's Christian. Paul became so humble. Yeah. Even he was like, he still was asleep after he was saved. Well, it says that the devil took him over, right? Doesn't it say that? I, I don't know if that's a figure of speech, like, in other words, the spirit of the devil, like, literally, or the, I, I think maybe, uh, I don't know, a temptation, evil, mm -hmm. or something, whatever. But if you look at all the accounts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, um, part of it boiled down to one of the 12, Matthew chapter 26, one of the 12 called Judas Iscariot went to the chief priest said, what are you willing to give me if I deliver him to you? For they counted out to him 30 pieces of silver, which was the price of a slave at that time. I didn't know the, what? Okay. That's the price of a slave. That was a price of a slave at that time. 30 pieces of silver. 
Yeah, he, he mm -hmm. was going to do it. But also right before then, you have the woman that anointed Jesus' feet with that oil. And it irked. It irked. I mean, it not only irked him, but it also irked the other apostles because they said when his disciples saw it, they were indignant. Why the waste? This fragrant oil may have been sold to give to the poor. And he said, why do you trouble the boy? And he showed her love. I was trying to find the passage where it said that he held the bag and maybe in just a few moments, I'll, I'll try to find it during a break. But anyway, all these things come into play here. Uh, and it's not in Luke's account either. Uh, so it may very, very well be in John. I won't say that it is in John. Right, right. So we're going back to Luke again. You've looked at all these guys. Verse 17. <clears throat> he came down with them and stood on a level place with a crowd of his disciples with a crowd of his disciples. Now, now, they're not the apostles, they're his disciples. A lot of times we get this confused, but you remember again, he had 120 disciples, but he chose 12 of them to be apostles. So don't always assume that this is just the 12. Yeah, I know I have too, but we can't, we can't do that in this particular context, all righty? And a great multitude of people from all Judea, Jerusalem, the Sea coast of Tyre and Sidon, that's up there on the Mediterranean Sea. So these, these people are going from everywhere from Judea all the way up to, Cam uh, to uh, Galilee. They're all following him, all righty? And so he came to heal him and to be healed of their diseases, as well as those who were tormented with unclean spirits. They were healed. And the whole multitude sought to touch him. A power went out from him, and he healed them all. So then he begins, this is Luke's account of the Sermon on the Mount. You see a lot of the similarity between this and the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. Matthew starts off with the Sermon on the Mount, I think, because he's trying to, at the very beginning of Jesus' ministry, and by the way, this is true. <laughs> I can speak as a preacher here. There have been a lot of times that I've used sermons that I preached at South Cobb and preached somewhere else, those same sermons, okay, depending on what the needs are of the congregation. Yeah. So the bottom line is it wouldn't be too surprising if Jesus used this sermon on numerous occasions. What was the purpose of the Sermon on the Mount? Matthew 5, 6, and 7. Some people take it, <clears throat> it's a prayer, but I mean, I think that there's things in there if you methodically go through it. Yeah. And someone did that once and I was watching him do it. And there's like little bits and pieces that you can actually take your prayer and take it to the right. our Lord. And again, some of those things, you're exactly true. I think Jesus adapted this sermon on numerous occasions depending on the circumstances. Mm -hmm. I think, secondly, that as you see it in Matthew's account, that Matthew starts it off so as to emphasize to everybody what it's going to cost to be a disciple. Jesus does not make it easy. He does not say it's going to be a walk in the park on a spring day, smelling the flowers and watching the butterflies. And that's not going to be it. And in fact, as you go into what we call the Beatitudes, they're totally upside down to the world's way of thinking. So in Luke's account, he starts off, blessed are you poor, for yours is the kingdom of heaven, or God. Blessed are you who hunger now, but you shall be filled. Is he talking about literal hunger? Maybe, but he also could be talking about what? Spiritual hunger. They have been trying to follow the laws of the Pharisees and the scribes and all these other laws, and it just seemed like they weren't getting anywhere. Can I find some peace? Can I find something somewhere? Yeah. You'll be filled. Blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. Now, you don't see that in the Beatitudes of Matthew 5, do you? No. Yeah. Blessed are you when men hate you. How many of us want to walk around getting trying to get everybody to hate us? I want folks to like me, but he's saying, listen, there's going to come a time when you will be hated. Be thankful, be blessed. And they will exclude you and revile you and cast out your name as evil 
They're going to talk bad about you. They're not going to have anything to do with you. Why? Because you are a Christian. You're a disciple. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy. Lord, I've been, I've been excluded. What's to be happy about that for? Because of why you were excluded. Your mind. Indeed, your reward is great in heaven, for in like manner their fathers did to the prophets. Unlike Matthew's account, woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. All right? Woe to you who are full, for you shall hunger. Spiritually, yeah. You think you've got it all figured out now? You may find out you've been eating the wrong stuff. Yeah. Woe to you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. Woe to you when all men speak well of you. For so their fathers did to the false prophets. Not just to the prophets, but to the false prophets. Whoa. You see what he's doing here? What is he doing? He's turning everything upside down. You know that last part when you said that, like, that really is like, you like really like if you're being liked by the whole world and the gospel is telling you probably you're not preaching the gospel. Mm -hmm. You're gonna hurt some feelings. And it's a, you know, what did you say when he started preaching? The crowd thinned out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> The point that he's trying to make, and I'm going to take a quick break here right after this, give us a chance to go to the bathroom. But the thing I want to make is I want you to point and see this. Jesus is telling them up front, you're going to be my disciple. You're going to have problems in this world. You're going to have some difficulties. And not just the difficulties everybody in the world is suffering. You're going to have to suffer because you are my people. You have to understand that. And he's telling them that up front. And when... <clears throat> We're going to be in trouble with the world. Or if we're happy in the world, it's because we've abandoned Christ. You, you, can't, you can't be both. And that's the reason why he goes on and says, so you need to rejoice because, <laughs> think about it in this respect, you're going to be completely fearless. You're going to be absurdly happy. And you're going to be in constant trouble with the world. <laughs> so, so there's the difference. I mean, that's, it's kind of flipped over. You, you see what I'm saying? <clears throat> that's it. That's it. Let's take about a quick five-minute break and then come on back and uh, we'll get started again. Okay? Mr. Williams. Yes. John 13, 29. Okay. John 13, 29. And Jewish held the bag. John 13, 29. All right, I'm looking it up now. Some thought, oh, thank you. He had the money box. There you go. Okay, all right. If you have need for the feast, then he should give something to the poor. poor. All righty, thank you, brother. I appreciate that. All right, you're welcome. Thank you very much. Judas had the money box. The New King James says. Back. Thank you. Uh, we are now at um, uh, verse 27. Luke 6, 27. He's going to tell us something that, that really kind of probably picked or got the attention of everybody at that point in time. And that definitely gets the attention of all of us today. And what is that? Well, how to live. I say to you who hear, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who spitefully use you. To him who strikes you on the one cheek, give him the other also. And from him who takes your cloak, give him your tunic. Give to everyone who asks of you, and from him who takes away your goods, do not ask them back. And just as you want men to do to you, you also do to them likewise. Boy, that's tough. Notice what Jesus is trying to emphasize here. He says, again, he's turning the world's thinking upside down. 
the world's thinking by movies and everything else is the strong shall survive. Yeah, you seek out number one. I'm watching out for number one. And Jesus says, no, you're my disciples. You watch out for everybody but number one. Love your enemies. Lord, that's easier said than done. But the beauty of it is, is Jesus exemplified it. He still loved those Pharisees. He still had compassion on those scribes. He still cared about those Sadducees. He could have gotten frustrated with those disciples on more than one occasion. Aren't you getting this yet? You see what I'm saying? Love your enemies. Again, it's not like that feeling. It's not an emotion. It's agape love. It's you're looking out for the better, the better for another person. You're seeking highest good, even for your enemies. Wow. For soul, right? Huh? I think for their soul. I think it's easy to say it like that. Like, for their soul. Yeah. They care for their actions. That's right. They really like care for their but you need to love them enough to do what? Try to convince them that they need to change their actions. Yeah. So, you know, Confucius said, the Stoics said, what you do not want done to yourself, do not do to others. Jesus is saying, no. What you want done to you, you do for others, even your enemy. Wow. That's a whole totally different thing, isn't it? That's a whole totally different thing. And so he's emphasizing the idea, the more you do this, the more you are like God. God is always looking out for our best. Despite the fact that we don't always put him first. You ever had a situation like that, Bill? Where someone was like willing to help for you and then you took the high road and were pleasant to them and then they felt bad? There have been a few occasions, yeah, yeah, but again, that's hard to do, isn't it? Especially when somebody's in your face, pointing their finger at you, telling you what you've done wrong, okay? Notice he goes on here. You see this whole point that he's trying to say here, he's, he's emphasizing something. He says, if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? I love my wife, my wife loves me, you know, but what credit is that? Sinners love those who are, love them. He says, what good is it if, if what good to, to those you do good to, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do the same. Sinners help other sinners, right? If you lend to those for whom you hope to receive back, what credit is that to you? One thing I've learned in my years as a preacher, if I give out money, I don't ever expect it back because I probably won't get it anyway. <laughs> okay, that's just the reality of the situation. And my wife has, has joked about it somewhat. She, she don't let me have a lot. I don't carry a lot of money. She said, every time I give it away, you, you ever give it to you, Annie, you always give it away. Okay, right. well, that's, that's, that's kind of it, you know. What do you do? You love your enemies. You do good and lend hoping for nothing in return. And your reward will be great. You'll be sons of the most high. And I've got this underlined in my Bible. I don't know if you do, but I want you maybe to think about it. He is kind to the unthankful and evil. We have another day of life. He's kind to us. Even when we're not where we need to be with him. This totally turns the world's thinking upside down. So he says, be merciful as your father in heaven is merciful. And this goes a little bit further than that. Judge not that you be not judged. Condemn not, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. What you're going to see in these next few verses, the rabbis at that time had the idea that a teacher must not linger on a point. Now, you've heard me linger on points a lot, amen? <laughs> That's the reason we're no further than what we are. But anyway, but the bottom line is, but if you're going to maintain interest, according to the rabbis, you must move quickly from one topic to another. 
and it was called Shiraz, which means to string beads together. You're putting all these beads together to make it a necklace, but they all, they are all of different shapes and different forms and things along that line. The idea is, as he's telling them, as he's going through this, notice he spoke a parable. Can the blind lead the blind? Will they not both fall into the ditch? A disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone who is perfectly trained will be like his teacher. Underline that part. If we're going to be perfectly trained, we're going to have to be like Jesus. And to be perfectly trained, training something means you have to go over and over it and over it and over it and over it, right? Why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but do not perceive the plank in your own eye? And there he talks about the way we judge, right? One person said there's so much bad in the best of us and so much good in the worst of us that it ill becomes any of us to find fault with the rest of us. <laughs> there's so much bad in the best of us and so much good in the worst of us, it becomes ill for any of us to find fault with the rest of us. <laughs> I like Jesus saying better, just don't judge, okay? <laughs> That's it, don't, don't go there. Don't look for the speck in your brother's eye whenever you've got a two before in yours, you know? And again, just a part of the same teaching, but we read there again in Matthew chapter seven, he says, how can you say to your brother, brother, let me remove that speck that is in your eye when you do not see the plank that is in your own eye? And I've seen those cartoons where somebody's walking around with a big old two before outside of their eye. Well, you've got a little speck right there you need to take care of, but you know, we all know what his point is. That is kind of crazy. Huh? I don't, I don't think we should that. We shouldn't. I mean, like, I'm saying like some people consider that like the Christians would say, okay, well, we're not Sorry. We're not condemning you. No. Sin. You just jumped up and said, I'm up. Yeah. <laughs> I'm up that. You know, and, and if you go and say, like, okay, well, you, John, I know that you don't do this, you don't tie, mm -hmm. that would be like, yeah. But they were also living in a culture today where everybody's got their feelings on their sleeves. So, that, you know, it don't take much to get us upset, yeah. does it? But I'm saying, like, yeah. it's like, like, we don't do that to most of them. I mean, I don't see it. Like we don't direct it right at somebody. We sort of let the word of God do yeah. the work. Right? That's let the word of God do the work. That's exactly right. That's the way it always ought to be. <laughs> remove the plank from your own eye, and then you will be able to see clearly to remove the speck that is in your brother's eye. Self-centered people cannot see well. <laughs> Self-centered people cannot see well. They're focusing always on themselves. Okay. He goes on a little further. A good tree does not bear bad fruit, but nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree is known by its fruit. Men do not gather figs from thorns, gather grapes from a bramble bush. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good. An evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart brings forth evil. Out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. It don't take long to tell whether or not somebody's at least trying to be a Christian or not. Listen to the way they talk. That's Listen to why, the way they talk. That's why man cannot control his sin. Mm -hmm. can that's right. And I think here, here's a point that, again, another commentator made. If you treat a man as he is, he will continue to be as he is. But if you treat a man as what he ought to be, then he can become what he ought to be. I think that's what Jesus is doing here. He's telling these folks, look, folks, you could do better than this. And he's telling us all the same thing, right? And we can be better. If I just continue to teach you and emphasize this the same thing to you over and over and over again, then it's not going to make any difference. You're not going to change. But if I can encourage you to be different, then it will. And that's the point. Another major point that he brings out is our lips show our heart. Our lips show our heart. 
And it doesn't take long, as I said earlier, to do that. So as he calls on, and, and he does the same thing in the book of Matthew chapter 7 as he comes to the end of the Sermon on the Mount there. Again, this is a very shortened version of it. Maybe, maybe Matthew had already written his book by this time, and Luke is just reiterating the points, maybe just a shorter, quicker way. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things which I say? We can't really call him Lord if we won't obey him. Okay? Whoever comes to me and hears my saying and does them, I will show you whom he's like. He's like a man building a house who dug deep, laid the foundation on the rock. When the flood arose, the tree beat vehemently against that house, could not shake it, for it was founded on the rock. But he who heard and did nothing is like a man who built his house on the earth, sand, without a foundation, against which the stream beat vehemently, and immediately it fell, and the ruin of that house was great. There's so many great lessons here. Jesus says, you're building your house on my sayings. Let the storms come. You'll be able to weather them. You build your house on anything other than that is going to take you away. There will always be floods. There will always be things that's going to knock out, knock your feet out from under you. It's always going to happen. And um, I just think a lot about that. Whether or not we stay faithful, whether or not we stay doing what God wants us to do depends on where we've got our feet planted. Mm -hmm. In Christ. And that's the point he makes in Matthew, and that's the point that, you, that Luke is making right here. And he's emphasizing, again, this, this whole thing thing. Storms are going to come. Storms are going to come. It's harder work to build on a rock than it is to build on sand. Okay? It's harder work. You're going to have to work harder. There's going to have to be a lot more sweat equity in it. And that's the way it is with Christianity. Chapter 7. When he concluded all his sayings in the hearing of the people, he entered Capernaum. Now he is in Capernaum. All righty. So now he's back up there around the Sea of Galilee. Capernaum seems to be Jesus' main base of operation when he's in, in Galilee, okay? So then you have this centurion, a certain centurion servant who was dear to him, was sick and ready to die. So when he heard about Jesus, he sent elders of the Jews to him, pleading with him to come and heal his servant. And when they came to Jesus, they begged him earnestly saying that the one for whom he should do this was deserving. For he loves our nation and has built us a synagogue. And Jesus went with him. When he was already not far from the house, the centurion sent friends and said, Lord, do not trouble yourself. I'm not worthy that you should enter into my roof. Therefore, I did not even think myself worthy to come to you, but say the word and my servant will be healed. I'm a man placed under authority, having soldiers under me, and I say to one, go, and he goes, and another, come, and he comes, and to my servant, do this, and he does it. And when Jesus heard these things, he marveled and turned around and said to the crowd, I have not found such great faith nowhere in Israel. And those who were sent returning to the house found the servant well who had been sick. Huh? Right. He obviously had been around, and this was Capernaum, so this was a very important city around the Sea of Galilee. He had obviously heard, maybe had heard even, even heard him preach on two or three occasions. It's always interesting that every place in scripture that, that mentions a centurion always speak of them in a positive note. Now, centurion at that particular time, uh, Polybius, who was another writer, he described centurions as men who could command. They were steady in action. They were reliable but they weren't anxious to get into a fight. But whenever they got into the fight, they stand there as they stood their ground or died at their post. Well, is, that a, is that a position? That was that? a position in the Roman army. I was thinking it was just a No, he was, he was, it was a commander 
Uh, the word century suggests the idea of a hundred. So there are some that have the idea that they were, they were centurions of, you know, that would be in charge of a hundred men. Then you would have some further graduated centurions that would be over 600 men, depending on the, the rank, you know, much like the military today. So that's where they got the idea. It was a soldier, a soldier, a man ready to fight no matter what the cost. So here, here he was. And at the same time, he was a Roman. And most of the time at that particular time, they were, they were not Jews. They were not Jews. So here was a guy that was not a part of the Jewish nation. He was a Gentile. And I've stressed to you all up to this book, the idea of how Jesus continues to emphasize the Gentiles listening to Jesus. Here's one of those situations. Look at how much faith this man had. Think about it for just a moment in this respect. The Jews even talked to him, talked to Jesus. Now, you got to remember the elders of the Jews. It's a different place. He is up in Galilee. He is not in Jerusalem. In Jerusalem, they're trying to catch him. Up in Galilee, they've heard enough of him. And you know what? Jesus can do something about this. The difference of, of areas, really. Think about it as this way as well. These Jews said, and they begged him earnestly, saying, he loves our nation. He built us a synagogue. And so you think about that in that respect. And here was a man that had all these other men serving him. He had a servant. This was during the time that slaves were just, it was a part of life. Slavery was a part of life. It was part of the family. Yeah, huh? In, in some cases it was, depending on what it was. But again, he had an unusual attitude toward a servant. He was, he, to a lot of the people at that time, he was just a living tool. And they treated servants, slaves, like, you know, they beat them, they killed them, whatever. You read stories of times back at those times and in, in that history where uh, if a man got older, he'd been a slave to a Roman all his life and that he couldn't do work or do anything anymore, then the, the Roman would say, well, go tie him to a rock and throw him in the river. You know, that's how they get rid of him. He was just, he wasn't a person. But look at how this man looks at his servant. He looks at him with dignity. A master could ill treat this man. He could do that or even have the slave killed off if he so chooses. Secondly, he's a deeply religious man. He built the Jews a synagogue. Think about that. One of the few centurions the Jews had anything good to say about. He had an extremely unusual attitude to the Jews. He was a humble man. He was a man of faith. Yeah, the, yeah, there is history. You could you could go back and look it up. Let me always encourage you to do this. I do not recommend Wikipedia. Okay, because sometimes they can kind of throw you off. But, but, but they might give you a starting place to start looking this stuff up, especially if they have those some of those some of those articles that have numerous footnotes. That gives you a good place to go and look this stuff up for yourself. But I wouldn't. I would not encourage anybody to just take Wikipedia to face knowledge. Well, okay, I, 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 you know. I, I hated all of that stuff about people. Like, I don't care what they say, just say whatever they want to say. But I got into the Reformation, all of this stuff. And that opened up a whole lot of stuff to me. I started to understand a lot more. Mm -hmm. And so I found that there there is some history does go to some pretty really good. That's right. Like, it kind of brings more things to life. You can say, okay, well, this was going on that time. That's probably why. Right. So you have this situation with centurions. Acts 10, 22. Remember the, the centurion 
that was preached to. He was the first Gentile convert, Acts mm -hmm. chapter 10. It was his house, Acts 22, 26, Acts 23, 17, Acts 24, 23, Acts 27, 43. I mean, there's, and, and every time that Luke mentions centurions, he's always got something good to say about them. And they were not all <laughs> killers, okay? Just something to think about. Verse 11 through 17, Jesus raises the widow of the son of Nain. Or say, raises the son of the widow of Nain. I'm sorry. The day after, when he went into the city called Nain, and again, he's still around the Sea of Galilee, so he's very close. He came near the gate of the city, and a dead man was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. And a large crowd from the city was with her. Now, let's talk for just a few moments about widows and what was going on at that time. There was no social security. There was no welfare. There was no health care. If the only thing that could take care of, the only person that would have the responsibility to take care of a widow would be her family. Now, Paul in the book of First Timothy will tell to Timothy, and we're going to see this also in the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 6, we read of a whole group of people where they were taking care of the widows. And we remember that they got into a dispute because the Hellenists, the Gentiles, felt like the Jews weren't taking care of their widows. In 1 Timothy chapter 5, Paul tells the young preacher Timothy, honor widows who are really widows. If any widow has children or grandchildren, let them first learn to show piety at home and to repay their parents, for this is good and acceptable for God. Now, is she who is truly a widow and left alone trust in God and continues in supplications and prayers, but she who lives in pleasure is dead while she lives? And then verse 8, if any provide not for his own, especially for those of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. The, the, the younger people were to take care of grandma. Yeah. Yeah. That's what he commands. If there was no family to take care of them, then it seemed like, as we read through the book of Acts, as well as here in 1 Timothy chapter 5, where Paul is writing to Timothy at Ephesus, it became the responsibility of the church to take care of those widows that had nobody else to support them. So notice he gives some specific qualifications of these widows. He said, we're not talking about a young widow that could get married again. You don't support them, but you support those that have nobody else to take care of. So he gives very specific commands to Timothy as Timothy is working in Ephesus. And again, you see that other background here in Hebrews, or excuse me, in Acts chapter 6. So this widow had one son, it looks like, and she didn't have nobody else. And that, would, that was going to put things very bad. Another example of a widow. No, 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 no. Well, she would have been a widow whenever Joseph died, but we don't know exactly when Joseph died. But I just remember the story of why she said John. Huh? The widow had hair that watched him speak. Mm. Oh, she was just a woman. She, she was, was just a woman, woman. yeah. Didn't John marry someone? Did what now? Did John marry someone's widow? I thought there was a verse about that. Uh, the, the one that I was thinking of was Naomi and Ruth. Mm. Remember that whole situation yeah. where she came back and the whole Leverite marriage law comes into play there? We have two widows there taking care of. Well, what did that, what did the younger woman do? What did the younger widow do? She took care of Naomi, didn't she? So you see, there's a principle all through the Bible that family needs to take care of family. Well, they didn't work too, right? Huh? They didn't work. Right? Yeah, they worked, but they didn't go to, they didn't go and get money to buy all this stuff, but they would work in fields and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. Because that was what the families did. It's, you know, you make it or break it. Everybody was going to work somehow, some way or another. 
So here was this, the point I'm trying to make is this is what's going on at that time. There was no social security. There was no safety net whatsoever. Mm -hmm. So whenever she lost her son, this suggested not only the loss of her son, but also <laughs> what am I going to do now? Especially if she was an older woman and couldn't take care of herself. So the Lord saw her and he had compassion on her and said to her, do not weep. And he came and touched the open coffin and those who carried him stood still. And he said, young man, I say to you, arise. And he who was dead sat up and began to speak. <laughs> you, never paid you, never, you never paid attention to that before. Never paid attention to the verse at all. Yeah. You, you see, look at here. Jesus just said, arise, and he did. One day he's coming again, and he's going to sell the whole, all those that are in the grave. And get up, and they're going to get up. One thing interesting here is we have these things here where <clears throat> Jesus is just speaking and things are happening. Yeah. Earlier we were reading about things where Jesus would lay his hands on them. Right. So it must not be any significance of laying on hands to accomplish something and just speaking. I, I think it was, I think it again depended, as I said last week, I think it also depended on the situation. If he was trying to make a point, he would put his hands on some of them. But then, as in the case with the man with the withered hand, if he had done anything, what would they have accused him of? Breaking the Sabbath. But on then all he did was what? Stretch out your hand. Oh, boom, it's fixed, you see? So I think it all would always depend upon the situation in, in some of these situations. And, and that's something we've got to take consideration as well. Can you say something like, um, well, who is that that touched me and took my power? Mm -hmm. That was a woman, and then he yeah. said it just the again. Way, we just went to another person that told him that, and then it said something different. Mm -hmm. They took all, they all touched him and took the power. Yeah, I'm assuming the power of the Holy Spirit, right? I, mean, I, I don't know exactly if it would be that power, the power that the Spirit had vested in him to heal. I, we don't know. We, we, yeah. If he says something, he doesn't have to do something in the name of Jesus. <laughs> that's right. That, that, that's it. He Whatever just he said is the authority. He did it. That's all that needed to happen. Suppose you're going, <laughs> suppose you're going to a funeral, and the man's been declared dead. The man just stops the whole thing and says, "Arise." Would you be amazed? Shocked? <laughs> yeah. 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 Probably would have. Probably would have. Elijah did that. Elijah did that. Yeah, Elijah did that, and Elisha both did that. So it, it's interesting along that line. It seems like, again, as you're looking through Scripture, it's only those that really were Jesus, obviously. Elijah, Elisha, uh, Peter raises Dorcas from the dead. No, Paul raised that boy from the dead, the third story window in Acts chapter 20. <laughs> After he'd preached a sermon till midnight. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But well, anyway, I, I'm not going to go down that road too far. <laughs> oh, somebody said something to me. He said, Well, Tommy, I understand why Eutychus fell out of that window because it is easy to fall asleep in the sermons. And I said, You better hope there's no. You're not sitting on the second or third floor, brother, because I'm sorry, I can't do anything to help you there. <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, it's a beautiful story, a story of how Jesus cared about a widow, a story about how Jesus was giving her her son back. And I'm sure that that woman was not complaining at all. He presented him to her mother, his mother, and fear came upon all. Some people try to sit back and say, well, this really wasn't a miracle because the man just may have been in a cataleptic trance. That's what, people try to explain. That's what they say. However, those folks knew what death was. They lived with it day in and day out, just like we did. Was it Lazarus? Okay. He, he 
Bad. Yeah, four and days in the tomb. There a while. By this time, King James, he stinketh. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's what the King James says. So, so there you go. And I think that's another reason why Jesus waited in that respect, so that it, this was the last great miracle that he did before he died on the cross. Right after that, the Jews said, This is it. We've got to put a stop to this guy. And it's shortly thereafter that he's put to death. Yeah. 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 So this, a great prophet has arisen among us. No, it's more, he's more than a prophet. See, people are still trying to figure Jesus out. Is he just a prophet? Is he Messiah? Definitely a prophet. Yeah, he's definitely a prophet. We know that, but is he Messiah? He's like Elijah. So all these things come into play there. And as Jesus is doing this, he is challenging them. So the disciples of John then reported to John concerning all these things. And John calling two of his disciples to him, sent him to Jesus and said, are you the coming one or do Louis look for another? Now I want you to stop for a moment. This is John the Baptist. A lot of people and, apart. Yeah, and a lot of people, like you said, take that apart. They said, well, what, why did John do that? Didn't he preach that this is the Messiah? He had. Well, and again, especially, <clears throat> John was in a prison in a place called Macarius. It was on the shores of the, of the Dead Sea. Okay? John had lived all of his life in the wilderness. He'd been a free man. He preached in the wilderness, baptized in the wilderness. He stayed out in the wilderness. Now he was arrested. Matthew 14 tells us because he dared to challenge the king and say, you shouldn't have her, Herodias, as your wife. Okay? He was in a dungeon. He couldn't see the sun, the stars. It would have had an, impact. Have had an emotional impact on him. And so he... Doubts come, folks. Doubts come. And, and it's at that moment in time that we have to sit down and, and answer those doubts. John called to his disciples, sent him to Jesus, said, are you the coming one or do we look for another? And they said, John the Baptist has sent us unto you, saying, are you the coming one or do we look for another? And, and so they get, and that very hour, Jesus cured many of the infirmities, afflictions, and evil spirits. To many blind, he gave sight. And Jesus said, go and tell John the things that you've seen and heard. What was the purpose of the miracles? To validate that Jesus was Messiah. What was the purpose of the miracles when Elijah did the miracles in the Old Testament? To per validate the fact that he was a prophet of God. Whenever the apostles go out after they've been taught and Peter, would, Peter and John would raise the lame man at the gate called beautiful in Acts 3. Or Paul would raise up Tabitha. Why? It was to confirm that they had the ability to speak the truth. Yeah. That was the main point. But I think like it benefited the people and Jesus and the apostles had compassion for them. But he got to perform these miracles so that the Jews would believe. But at the same time they were doing it yeah. And so as you look at this, he didn't give John any encouraging words other than just go and tell him what you've seen and heard. That ought to be enough. That would convince John that his mission and his work was what it needed to be. The blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he who is not offended by me. The word offended here comes from a Greek word that's, that does not, is not caused to stumble because of me. And so they took the message back to John. And no doubt in that cell, he said, okay, I've done the work that I need to do. When the messengers of John departed, 
he began to speak to the multitude concerning John. He said, what did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? Now think about that for just a moment. People love to watch the spectacular, right? Yeah, he, he really was. He really was. And Jesus is asking the question. He said, what did you go out to see? Did, so did you just go out to see something spectacular? No. He said, did you go out to see a man clothed in soft garments? <laughs> Those who clothe in soft garments, what? They live in luxury in king's courts. What did you go out to see, a prophet? He said, I tell you more than a prophet. This is he of whom it is written, behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. And again, he's quoting from Malachi, chapter 3 at verse 1, and Isaiah 40, verse 3. For I say to you, among those born of women, there is not a greater prophet than John the Baptist, but he who is least in the kingdom is greater than he. Wow. Yeah. And, and think about this. He says, you know, the least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. When all the people heard him, even the tax collectors justified God having been baptized with the baptism of John. But the Pharisees, <laughs> go through the Bible and just read how many times in the gospel that phrase comes up, but the Pharisees, <laughs> okay, <laughs> but the Pharisees and lawyers rejected the will of God for themselves, not having been baptized by him. And then he says this, he's asking this question, to what then shall I liken the men of this generation? What are they like? He said, they're like children in the marketplace. Calling to one of the southern, we played the flute for you and you did not dance. We mourned to you and you did not weep. John the Baptist came neither drink, eating bread nor drinking wine. And you said he has a demon. The son of man comes eating and drinking. And you said he's a friend of tax collectors and sinners. He's a glutton. He's a wine bibber. He said, we can't make you happy. <laughs> There's no way in the world. You're always going to come up with a different thing. But wisdom is justified by all her children. John was prophesying of me. And you'll also notice that whenever John was put to death, probably shortly thereafter, Matthew 14 again gives us that whole story. But whenever you see that happening, Jesus gets off to himself and spends some time. Yeah, John four, or Matthew 14. Jesus heard it. He departed from there by de boat to a departed place, deserted place by himself. But when they heard it, the multitude followed him on foot from the cities. John was his kinfolk. They were scared of him. Yeah. Of John the Baptist. Yeah. He showed them up before Jesus. And, and so he commended John and what John did. All of this going with the Pharisees and so forth. They had given spies. They had done all these other things in an effort to try to trip Jesus up some way or another. So now we have an example of a Pharisee inviting Jesus to his house. So this one of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him. And he went to the Pharisee's house and sat down to eat. Now, you've got to remember that back in those days, they ate different than what we do. They did not sit around the kitchen table and they did not sit around the table like we're sitting around tables here. They actually had a table in the middle of the room. It was a very low table that was raised up just a little bit and you actually had pillows that you kind of laid on and you actually were reclining when you were eating, okay? You would dip your sop, you would dip the bread in the sop, whatever that was. You'd use that piece of bread and, and scoop up whatever you're gonna eat and eat laying, kind of laying down. Now, I just want to remind you of that, because again, sometimes we don't see the picture here. When it says he sat down to eat, it wasn't it. He was reclining around this table, a very low table. All righty. And a woman in the city who was a sinner. A woman who was a sinner. When she knew that Jesus sat in the table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster fat flask of fragrant oil and stood at his feet behind him. Okay, so she's, she's behind him, weeping. And she began to wash his feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head 
and she kissed his feet and anointed him with the fragrant oil. What love. What love. The whole city knew she was a sinner. We make a lot of assumptions about that. We don't know exactly what kind of sinner she was, but the whole city knew about it. <laughs> Tax collector and the Pharisees knew it. They knew he'd have mercy on the uh, tax collector. Yeah. Humble. That's right. And here was this woman. She didn't, I want you to picture this if you can. She actually got into the Pharisee's house. Under any other circumstance, that Pharisee would have kicked her out on her, put her out on her ear. You're a sinner. You don't need to come into my house. You're defiling me in my house. And Jesus was there. It could be, it could be. And again, depending on the, there's some paintings and so forth, but it could be that people were walking by the street or on the street may have seen this and she just kind of slipped in without even really drawing attention to herself. Okay. It wouldn't have been no big deal. It would, you know, it was, that's the way it was at that particular time. And so she begins to cry and she begins to wash his feet with her tears. And she then kisses his feet and then she anoints them with oil. And, and the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he spoke to himself. And this man, if he were a prophet, would know what manner of woman this is. He's touching him for she's a sinner. It made him feel better. Why? Jesus don't even know who he's dealing with here. Simon knew exactly, or Jesus knew exactly what he was thinking. He said, Simon, I have something to say to you. He said, teacher, rabbi, say it. There's a certain creditor who had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. Now, for those of you that are really don't really know this, but a denarii was a day's wage. Okay? That's what you would make in one day. All righty? So you had one guy that owed 500 denarii. That means 500 days. That's a year and a half, over a year and a half. He would have to work for that guy for free for over a year and a half to pay his debt off. Well, you can't work for free. <laughs> you can't work for free and, and pay the bill. You know what I'm trying to say? The other owed 50. And when they had nothing which to repay, he freely forgave them both. So tell me, Simon, which one of them would love him more? And Simon said, I suppose the one whom he forgave more. He said, you've rightly judged. I think, again, Jesus was getting him in this trap and making him think about what he was doing. He was judging the woman. And he says, you see this woman? We don't know who she is. Some people think she may have been Mary Magdalene. And the reason why that is is because in chapter 8, verse 1, Mary Magdalene is mentioned. So a lot of people jump, make the jump, uh, jump to the assumption that it's Mary Magdalene here in chapter seven. We can't say that for sure. We cannot say that for sure. Does it say that Mary Magdalene was there, or is that another assumption? <clears throat> it says that Mary Magdalene had was healed of evil spirits and infirmities, which had come out seven demons. So some people think that this was Mary Magdalene, but if you look at chapter eight, verse one. It came to pass afterward that he went through every city and village and certain women who had been healed and Joanna, the cry for Chusa and Susanna and me and the others also provided for him their substance. So we don't know when Mary Magdalene was healed. We don't know. We, we, we can't make the assumption, but a lot of people do make that assumption because chapter eight, verse one comes in there. He said, do you see this woman? I entered your house, but you gave me no water for my feet. Now, whenever you were invited to somebody's house at that point in time, you've got to remember most of the people were wearing sandals. Their feet were dirty. It would be the job of the lowliest servant in the house. Whenever you come in the house, you take your sandals off and they would wash your feet. You know, don't track in the mud. <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you know what I'm trying to say? Don't, don't track in the mud. 
<clears throat> okay, there you go. <laughs> but he said, you gave me no water for my feet. You, she has washed my feet with her tears then wiped them with the hair of her head. Then after the, you had the, you know, the, the feet washing as it was, cleanse the feet off, then you would be anointed with oil, you know, pour a little bit of oil on their head, getting out of the hot sun. And he said, you know what? They would kiss, they would kiss. And again, it would be back on the cheek. We've seen those pictures a lot of times in movies where men would kiss one another on the it's cheek. Like Arabic thing still, yeah, it still is, yeah, yeah. You gave me no kiss, but this woman has not ceased to kiss my feet since the time I came in. You did not anoint my head with oil, but this woman has anointed my feet with fragrant oil. Therefore I say to you, her sins which are many are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. Now I want you to think about that for a minute. I've met a lot of people that think that they don't have, they've not really done that much to be forgiven for. Okay. <laughs> I'm serious. I, I've met some of those folks. That's crazy. And they, they, well, I just really haven't done that much to be forgiven for. Of course, they don't understand the gospel, that one sin, <laughs> one sin unforgiven and unpaid for, <laughs> you're still going to lose it, buddy. I, I, you know? I, I would keep account. I would say, I probably put forgiveness and sins, even if I think I did it. Mm -hmm. Just to be on the safe side. But if there's something I don't know about, Lord, please take that from Yeah. And Lord, if there's something I need to correct, you better show it to me, please. <laughs> right? And, and you, you think about this again a minute. He he said, then he says to her, your sins are forgiven. Don't, why do they accuse him of blasphemy there? That's crazy, but they do. Well, by what Jesus had just said to this Pharisee, sure. Sure. I mean, <laughs> that would have been like asking for, you know, oh, I don't have enough mud on my face. He's going to smear it all over me now, you know, if he had said it or something. And again, they begin to ask, who is this who forgives sins? And he goes back to what we had said earlier, right? Only the one who has the power to forgive. So he says, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Did, did, was the, well, the prophet couldn't do that, right? Some of them might have, but we don't really read of any. I don't read of any what situation where the prophet, a prophet ever pronounced those words. No. Does anybody do that? Nobody does that. Nobody. Nobody in the Bible ever. Nobody. Nobody but Jesus says your sins are forgiven. Because they all understood that was God's prerogative. Yeah. That's God's prerogative. All right, chapter eight. We're getting along faster. We have to, okay? <laughs> uh, it came to pass that he went through every city and village preaching and bringing the glad tidings. What is another word for glad tidings? Gospel. Oh, yeah. Gospel of the kingdom of God. And the 12 were with him. The 12 what? The apostles now. They're, they're the apostles now. Certain women had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities. Mary called Magdalene. Uh, out of whom had come seven demons, Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's steward, and Susanna, and many others who provided for him from their substance. Again, notice the emphasis of Luke upon the women. He's going to mention the women at the cross. Many of these very same women that are mentioned here are going to be at the cross of Jesus. They're going to be there to anoint him and are going to be there early that Sunday morning to finish up the burial that they had to rush through that Saturday or that Friday evening. So when a great multitude had gathered, they come to him from every city. He spoke by parable. A sower went out to sow his seed. As he sowed, some fell by the wayside and it was trampled down and the birds of the air devoured it. Some fell on a rock and as soon as it sprang up, were withered away because it lacks moisture. Some fell upon thorns and thorns sprang up and choked it, but other fell on good ground, and he yielded a crop a hundredfold. And when he said these things, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. And this same parable is told in Matthew chapter 13. And we know how it all plays out, right? I'm sure, huh? Yeah. And, yeah, sowing the word, 
sowing the seed and how people are going to accept it. Okay, and if you look at it, only one group of people, 25%, are going to make good use of it. Which emphasizes the ideal as you, as you look at all of this, Jesus would say, many are called, but few are chosen. What's he saying? I'm preaching the gospel to everybody. Everybody has a chance, but if they choose not to obey it, then that's on them. Mm -hmm. It also teaches us, Matthew's account especially, it teaches us how we receive the word is very important. If we don't receive it into our hearts, if we don't think about it, then what? Then it could be like that stony ground, the wayside, it gets trampled down, birds come and peck it, take it away. Some fell on rock, and but the rock was just had a little bit of dirt on it, and it was rock underneath. It couldn't get any good roots in. Yeah, right. And that's the thorns. Yeah, the devil chokes it. Yeah. Yeah. So you had the, the seed, wayside seed, which never even gets a good start because it's immediately taken away. You had the stuff shown on a rock where it starts, but it can't get any deeper. There's a lot of Christians that don't go any deeper than just the rock, and they never grow past that. And then whenever the sun comes down and the trying times come, what do they do? They wilt away, right? And then there's those that fell among thorns, and that's where you were talking about earlier, Josh, where it talks about the idea of being choked out. You're choked out. Yeah, Matthew, Matthew emphasizes that. But those who fell on good ground yielded a crop a hundredfold. And he who has ears to hear. So every one of these things in Matthew's account brought out again in Luke's account, but it also depends upon how the seed enters our hearts. Hearts. How it enters our minds. And whether or not we accept it and whether or not we allow it to grow and prosper. It depends upon us, right? Depends upon whether or not we are going to allow it to have that place in our hearts or not. All right? So the disciples then begin to ask him, and, and if you go back again in Matthew's account, it's interesting that Jesus now begins to tell a lot more parables. Up to this point in time, he's been doing a lot of just plain preaching. But now all of a sudden, he starts going to parables. Different people hear different ways depending on how they've been brought up, depending on a lot of different things. Some people hear stories and they connect with the story better. Some people just want the absolute truth laid out there for them one way or another. That's it. Yeah. Tell me what to do and when to do it and how to do it. And I'll do it that way. You know, it, it's God is using all these different kinds of ways to get into people's hearts, but the word is still the main thing they've got to take into consideration. It depends on how they accept that word. So the disciples asked, what does this parable mean? And they said, you know, to you it's been given to know the mysteries of the kingdom and parables, but to the rest, or to the kingdom of God, but to the rest it's given in parables that seeing they may see and not see, and hearing they may not understand or understand. The seed is the word of God. And those by the wayside are the ones who hear. The devil comes and takes the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. The ones on the rock are those who, when they hear, receive the word with joy, but they have no root, who believe for a while, and in time of temptation or trial, they fall away. He said the devil takes away the word out of the heart. What the, the action following that? So they received the word, they got the word, but then follow Jesus. Right. And the devil comes and takes that word out of their heart. Yeah. Listen, folks, sometimes the devil comes after us right after we become Christians. He's going to stay after us. He's going to stay after us and stay after us all the time we are Christians. Just, just, okay. That's just part of it. What do you need to do? Get root, grow deep. Get deep in the word. Understand it. Thank you. Oh, everybody that's taking this online and everybody here, thank you because you're wanting to go deeper. That's the way you need to be. That's the way you need to be. You got to get ammunition. Yeah. You got to, have, well, not just the ammunition, but also for your own health, right? I mean, for your own spirit. Against the devil. 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's exactly right. That's right. So dig deep. The ones who fell among the thorns, what? They're choked with the cares, riches, and pleasures of life. <laughs> Satan's going to be there trying to give you those cares and those riches and those pleasures. Sometimes I think, especially us Americans, we have so much. We enjoy so much that that's probably the one part that really hits us worse than anything else because we to put too much emphasis upon our riches, our pleasures, our easy chairs, you know, and that's what, that's what chokes it out of our lives. But the ones that fell on good ground are those who heard the word with a noble and good heart, keep it and bear fruit with patience. The word patience there is endurance. You bear fruit with endurance. Long suffering. Long suffering. Yes. Yes. You hang in there until the end. You don't quit. You keep on keeping on. You keep on keeping on. <clears throat> so he now gives another parable. No one, when he's lit a lamp, covers it with a vessel and puts it under a bed, but sets it on a lampstand that it might, those who enter might see the light. Truth helps us to see the light, see where we really stand. A lot of times we might think everything's going okay with us, and then something devastating might happen, and it calls it pulls us to call up or it causes us to pull up short and say, What's happening? Why, why am I in this situation? Why me, right? And it's at that moment in time that we grow more. Because why? Because we've been comfortable all this time. You got to get out of your comfort zone sometimes. And sometimes it takes something like that to happen to make us wake up. And so he says, you know, some people, whenever that happens, they just turn their back on God and say, well, if God's going to treat me that way, I, I, I'm just not even going to try anymore. Others say, no, it drives me to my knees and I need God more than ever. See, we, we've got to, I love what Jesus is saying here. Nothing in secret <clears throat> that will not be revealed nor anything hidden that will not be made known and come to light. Take heed how you hear. Take heed how you hear. Take heed how you hear. Yeah. You know, on any, on any Sunday morning, whenever you're listening to the preacher, some folk go to sleep. Some folks are watching the baby in front of them. Some folks are snoring. <laughs> you know what I'm trying to say? And the bottom line is, is, it's on us. It's, to people trying to with all the doctrine floating around. Well, and there's something about that as well, but in this context of what he's just saying, with he's got finished talking about, you know, the different soils that we have, then in this context, it also suggests the idea that, you know, how we hear the word of God. We'll make a decision, make a determination as to whether or not we're growing or not. And again, we need to test the script, you know, uh, what is it? Uh, um, search, the scriptures. search the scriptures daily to see whether these things are so. Acts 11, verse 26. Yeah. So, um, uh, you know, it's kind of a test. How do we hear? How do we hear? Do you tune out somebody whenever they're teaching? Well, I hope not, but I also know how easy it is to get distracted. And listen, on any Sunday morning, Satan's going to be there to help you get distracted. <laughs> I'm going to be honest with you there. It, it, you know, you're going to see that cute little baby that's right there in front of you. So you start oh, man. Stuff. Huh? Yeah. Did that before? Well, well, you didn't even notice it. You started jumping like, can I get a boat? Yeah. 
This is not important right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, seriously. That's, and, and I see, you know, as a preacher, sometimes I could see the moment when some people tune me out. <laughs> I can see it just like quit. I mean, you, you can see it. You can see what's happening. I wonder, did anybody tune Jesus out? Probably. Probably. Or they may have sat back and said, well, you know, that applies to those Pharisees that don't apply to me. <laughs> good, yeah, good. You they know, heard what they wanted to hear. They hear what they want to hear. Probably. Yeah. Take heed how you hear. When they heard all the whole said, he said, well, you know, you got to deny your riches. What? Uh, I, I'm so I didn't hear that here. part about the richest part. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the guy walked away. He went, like, oh. Yeah. Now, Luke, I, here's an interesting little tidbit here that we often don't look at, but his mother and brothers came to him. And they could not approach him because of the crowd. And it was told him by some, your mother and your brothers are standing outside desiring to see you. Now, in Mark's account of this same passage, Mark chapter three, and by the way, this is what goes on more in the life of Christ than, than here, but in Mark chapter three at verse um, 31, his brothers and his mother came and standing outside, they sent him calling him and a multitude was sitting around. Look, your mother and brother are outside seeking you. And he says, who is my brother or brothers? He looked around in a circle. Here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does the will of God is my brother and my sister and my mother. So here you have the same thing. Only Luke brings out the idea they could not get close to him because of the crowd. The other account of this is found in Matthew chapter 8. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Let me make sure about that. No, he did not deify her. That's exactly true. Uh, the other account is in Matthew 12. Matthew 12, I think, says that his mother, that they actually told him his mother and brother is willing to talk to them, talk to him. Um While he was still talking to the multitudes, Matthew 12, his mother and brother stood outside seeking to speak with him. And they said, who is my mother and brother? So they were wanting to talk to him. Some people, again, read again a little bit more into the text than I think is there. Some commentaries on this particular passage emphasize the idea that they thought he was going crazy and they wanted to pull him aside and say, look, you need to settle down. You know, and Jesus just in essence says, look, the ones who obey my father's will, my mothers and brothers and sisters and so forth. So all of these things come in there. They're the, they're the ones who hear the word of God and do it. So again, just continuing to emphasize the parable of the sower and all of these things in this whole section, he's emphasizing, what does it boil down to? You want to be my brother? Do the word of God. Follow the fa father's will. That's what it's all about. <clears throat> I was trying my best to get through chapter eight. It is 10 minutes till. Let's stop there. Huh? Well, again, and, and again, we've got so much to cover, so much to cover to try to get this done. So um, I hope so. I hope so. So next week we pick up, that's going to be the, um, what is that going to be? 25th to 25. February, March, April. April. Yeah. So we've got to get through this and all of March. It's going to end about the third week in April. So, but we're we're rocking along. Do you teach uh, any other Bibles over here? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, at the same time. No. Well, yeah, I don't know. I, I want to keep in touch with him. Okay. But yeah, we, uh, I've taught a lot of different classes here. I really have. Yeah. Um, I wanted I've, to do more, but I couldn't. Yeah. Well, there wasn't a lot of classes. I felt like there was only two. Mm -hmm. that were like, well, one or two here on Thursday. Yeah. But I wanted to, yeah. to take more classes. And the ones that I teach, mm -hmm. Or I'm trying to teach lately. I've been in classes I have not taught. Why? So I can grow. 
<laughs> you know, that's that's it. You got to keep pushing yourself.